So I just want to welcome you and uh, thank you all for being here. Our session's name is uh, Does Psychological Anthropology Need a Post-Colonial Psychology? I'm going to start with uh, Byron Good. Whose paper is going to be called Theorizing the Subject in Contemporary Ethnography? Thank you, Bob. So thank you to all of you stalwarts who show up at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and thank you, Doug, for all the work of organizing this event. It's really nice. So my talk is a kind of overview and a kind of background paper uh, for this entire panel. Ethnographers writing about psychological ex experience face far different challenges than those faced or at least addressed by classical theorists of the relations between culture and experience, culture and the person, or culture and personality. Ethnographers and members of the societies in which they work today are haunted by complex memories of violence, betrayals, and profound inequalities, many of which are rooted in histories of colonialism and neo-colonial reworkings and reproducings of these histories. At the same time, many participate in extraordinarily diverse forms of creative self-fashioning, aesthetic enactments, and social, political, and religious movements. The basic claim of this panel is that the psychological theories and forms of writing that seemed to serve psychological anthropology well for mu much of its history simply seems inadequate for addressing what feels to be important in the work that many of us do today. Both terms, culture and psychology, seem increasingly limiting and problematic. The goal of this panel is to open a discussion about these matters. To say a bit more about the genealogy of this panel, I want to begin with a bit of my personal intellectual biography, describing how I came to these issues and how I've been attempting to reframe the way I think and write about the basic practices and theories of psychological anthropology. And I'll start with a vignette. In the, 19, in the late 1990s, I was asked to participate in a California statewide summit on cultural diversity in mental health care, held in Oakland, I remember, uh, opened by Jerry Brown and attended by mental health workers from around the state. But what I most recall is a plenary lecture that was given by a cl clinical psychologist, Lillian Comas Diaz, now a professor at George Washington University and a leader in the Transcultural Mental Health Institute in Washington, D.C., who gave a stirring talk about critical feminist postcolonial psychology and its use in clinical services. Her talk drew explicitly on Foucault, liberation psychology, postcolonial writing, and feminist theory, all familiar to anthropologists, but taking on special meaning in the context of a meeting on cultural diversity and mental health care and dealing with issues of culture, not via sort of classic concepts of ethnic groups as cultural groups, etc. I, along with Mary Jo and Arthur Kleinman, was at that time still directing our NIMH training program defined as a training program in culture and mental health services research and was finding the very term culture in that formula particularly problematic. In 2000-2001 we organized our Friday morning seminar to focus on subjectivity, developing a series of papers that eventually led to the book Subjectivity Ethnographic Investigations of which Jabil is the first editor. In 2001-2002, we made the decision to reframe issues, asking speakers to discuss their work on subjectivity, but this time replacing the term culture with the term postcolonial in their analyses. What resulted was an interesting refiguring of issues that we had been addressing in the seminar over the past two decades addressing issues faced by African American communities in this country by American Indians, by diverse Latino communities, and many um, Im immigrant communities in terms of post-colonial experience brought quite different issues into focus 
Then research focused on culture and mental health services among American minority groups. It made relevant writings by such Latin American liberation psychologists as Ignacio Martin Barro, whose work I had been introduced to decades earlier by Janice Jenkins. Terry O'Neill used this framing to tell me about a body of literature being developed by American Indian psychologists explicitly addressing a history of losses associated with colonial devastation and the American Indian Holocaust. Um, and also, uh, Terry, I remember, sent me a, uh, a uh, syllabus for a course she was teaching on post-colonial psychology. Uh, Stefania's work on North Africa helped take me back to the writings of Franz Fanon on North Africa on the one hand and the complex play of Lacanian ideas in post-colonial psychiatry in Morocco. Angela Garcia then helped me completely refashion, you remember, the theory course I'd been teaching for years, placing Lacan and Lacanian influenced writers on political subjectivity and feminism, along with post-colonial writings at the very heart of our readings. Teaching that course over the years with Michael Fisher and with Alistair Donald, a psychoanalyst and anthropologist, has been a key site for working through these ideas. Sadek Raimi began coming down to Boston from Montreal, bringing his own interests in writing on political subjectivity. Uh, and about this time, I also became myself involved in psychoanalysis in a way that began to have unexpected influences in my writing and thinking. And then in 1996, Mary Jo and I began working intensely in Indonesia a society with a very different form of colonial experience than Turkey or Iran where we had worked earlier and where we have become deeply involved in issues of political violence and the ways in which societies in which, in, in which such violence is hidden from view and is misremembered erupting in psychotic experience on the one hand and in moments of political activism and dramatic political ruptures on the other. All of this history is present in the book Postcolonial Disorders, for which then uh, Mary Jo, Sandra Hyde, Sarah Pinto, and I edited that also came out of, um, out of these years of work. Now, what has emerged for me is a conviction that much of the phenomenologically oriented writings on culture and the person, as well as the more classic uh, psychoanalytic writings in, in, in psychological anthropology, while important, are inadequate for the kinds of works in which I and many of my students and former students and former fellows and many of us are, in, are currently engaged. In much of this work, the psychological can never be far from the political and the political never far from the psychological. And both are grounded in histories of violence and loss and perceived oppression, as well as incredibly creative efforts by individuals and communities focused on issues of social justice, human rights, and new forms of democratic politics. The questions that motivate this panel, then, on what forms of psychology are appropriate for psychological anthropology um, engaged in these, are engaged in these domains. In the time that remains, I want to make four basic claims in very truncated form. First, I suggest that the analytic term subjectivity marks a change in the framing of psychological anthropology, denoting a set of critical issues for anthropologists working in contemporary societies, which are different from those raised by classic studies of self, or person in emotion, or cultural psychology. The term subjectivity signals critical writings related to the genealogy of the subject and to the importance of colonialism, claims of modernity, and the figure of the colonized other for writings about the emergence of the modern subject. It denotes attention to hierarchy and exclusions, to violence and modes of governance, to new forms of citizenship, and to subtle modes of internalized anxieties that link subjection, subjectivation, and subjectivity. It indicates the importance of linking national and global economic and political processes to the most intimate forms of everyday experience. It suggests the place of the political at the heart of the psychological and the psychological at the heart of the political. 
For much of the literature on subjectivity, the term subject refers references the sujet of French psychoanalytic, post-structuralist, and feminist writing, locating discussions in theoretical territories that evoke strong reactions among many anthropologists. Good reason. The post-structuralist suspicion of the human as subject and the focus on subject position over lived experience leads too often to thick theory and thin ethnography. On the other hand, the language of subjectivity signals a complex psychological understanding of the subject, one for which current, um, many current psych psychoanalytic or more classic uh, conceptualizations and methods seem uh, are, 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 uh, are relevant. The, the Lacanian vocabulary provides a language for linking aspects of conscious, consciousness and psychological experience with the linguistic and institutional in a way that the Freudian corpus tends not to do. The hypothesis here is that a project of ethnographic studies of subjectivity drawing on these theoretical frames is both feasible and productive and requires a reframing of the psychology of psychological anthropology. My second claim is that viewing subjectivity through the lens of the post-colonial provides a language and analytic strategies valuable for investigations of lives, institutions, and regimes of knowledge and power in the society, some real post-colonial in the sense of having a his history of, post of colonialism and others that do not, in which many anthropologists work today. Whether directly addressed or not, whether working on societies that were formerly part of European and North American colonialism or not, the figure of the colonial haunts ethnographic writing. Anthropologists are well aware of the colonial history of the discipline. Writing culture has been subject to critiques of Orientalism and efforts to represent individual lives of others is often contested as speaking for the other. Indeed, for new generations of anthropologists, the whole enterprise of ethnography becomes suspect. <clears throat> In her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, Linda Tuhiwe Smith, director of the International Research Institute for Maori and Indigenous Education at the University of Auckland, writes, from the vantage point of the colonized, a position from which I write and choose to privilege, the term research is inextricably linked to European imperialism and colonialism. The word itself, research, is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. When mentioned in many indigenous contexts, it stirs up silence. It conjures up bad memories. It raises a smile that is knowing and distrustful. Uh, something probably Terry knows about. Um, no amount of theorizing will resolve the conflicts inherent in ethnographic research and writing. The hypothesis here, however, is, the, is that the work of historians and literary critics and students of the subaltern and the postcolonial, many of whom are scholars from postcolonial societies, along with inventive new forms of ethnographic writing and collaborative projects, provide tools for addressing the ghosts of colonialism present for anthropologists and for members of the societies in which we work alike. My third claim is that attention to disorders, as in, the, as, as in our phrase post-colonial disorders, is critical to the ethnography of subjectivity, in particular for medical and psychiatric anthropologies. The term disorders is obviously a broader category than illness, marking an enlarged scope of work uh, for those of us interested in psychopathology, for example. On the other hand, on the one hand, it bridges the individual and the societal, linking the madness of the state and of individuals, collective and individual memories, repressions and remembering. On the other, it denotes that which is set off as threatening to, quote, order. Historians have shown that the strategic assemblage of ideas, institutions, and forms of domination that constituted colonialism in the name of God, science, and capital, or under the rubric of Christianity, civilization, and commerce, each powerful structures in the Lacanian symbolic, all functioned to establish and maintain distinctive local orders 
modes of social life characteristic of a particular enlightenment vision of reason, progress, and freedom. Indeed, the very origins of the modernist equation of disorder with the mad, the primitive, and the bestial, all characteristics of the other, are found in the efforts to enact and instantiate uh, a bourgeois colonial order. And here I'm referencing in particular an essay by Joie Biel in this post-colonial disorders book. Attention to disorders thus forces attention to the establishment of very particular political, moral, and epistemic orders, often through mechanisms of state violence. Acknowledging the links between the political and the psychological, between states of order and disorder, is of course only the statement of a problem, not a solution. Many anthropologists draw on Foucauldian analyses of, sub, of subjugation and subjection in the formation of the subject to explore these linkages in ways sometimes useful but often producing over-determinist views of the role of governmentalities in producing unitary subjects and modes of consciousness. Many have drawn on clinical terms, trauma, anxiety, dissociation, paranoia, insecurity in ways that are again sometimes insightful at other times more metaphorical than technical in their use. Some have advocated suffering or social suffering as more experience near frames for analysis, placing particular primacy on the existential, phenomenological, and moral, producing an important body of ethnographic writing. The use of moral and religious languages as analytic categories and the essentialization of suffering as a distinctive mode of experience are also, however, not without difficulties. There is an obvious hazard to approaching subjectivity among post-colonial societies through a focus on disorder or pathology. If research is as suspect among indigenous peoples, as Linda Duhiway Smith indicates, research on social pathologies is particularly problematic laden with colonial history and power relations. <clears throat> in the colonial context, the pathologies of native cultures were routinely cited as evidence of the inferiority of the colonized and as mandate for intervention. In liberal societies, focus on the pathologies of indigenous peoples or the poor is equally used as mandate for intervention by international agencies that produce what Mariella Pandolfi calls uh, mobile sovereignty. Recognizing, labeling, studying, responding to social pathologies are thus located in complex terrains of post-colonial histories and relationships. A benefit of linking disorders to subjectivity, however, is the potential for increasing understanding of the lived experience of persons caught up in complex, threatening, and uncertain conditions of the modern world. <clears throat> modern world. It, provides a focus on the historical genealogy of normative conceptions associated with order and disorder, rationality and pathology, and it brings analytic attention to everyday lives and routine practices instantiated in complex institutions. Addressing such issues lies at the heart of much contemporary work in medical and psychological anthropology. Finally, my fourth claim is that studies of subjectivity need to pay attention to that which is not said overtly, to that which is unspeakable and unspoken, that which appears at the margins of formal speech and everyday presentations of self manifest in the imaginary, in dissociated spaces and individual dream time, and coded in esoteric symbolic productions aimed at hiding as well as revealing. This suggests close attention to memories and subjugated knowledge claims that are suppressed politically but made powerful precisely by their being left unsaid. Attention to that <clears throat> which speakers strate strategically refuse to speak about in settings of surveillance and danger, to painful secrets and poisonous knowledge in Vina Das's terms, and to traumatic memories and hidden transcripts which may fade from everyday awareness but have explosive power when evoked. It suggests attempts to form knowledge coded in highly. It, it suggests attention to forms of knowledge coded in highly symbolic art, in cartoons or in theatrical performances, as well as that which is so embedded in language and everyday practices shaped by contemporary assemblages 
of knowledge power that they become invisible to subjects depending on their positions of power. Discussion of this of the secret, the hidden, the unspoken, and the unspeakable as qualities of subjectivity, of the irrational and incomprehensible forms of violence and aggression, of the motivating force of longing or desire, of loss, mourning, or revenge, of remorse or guilt, of sensibility disrupted by displacement and social disintegration, as well as that which is impossible to speak, here refer referencing the unconscious, all disguised, more than revealed, by rational discourse, obviously has resonance with a wide range of psychoanalytic theories. Do these then belong to the domain of psychological anthropology? The claim here is that anthropologists cannot not attend to these issues if we're to address forms of lived experience in the settings in which many of us work today. We cannot neatly dissociate the socio social and political from the psychological if we are not to abdicate subjectivity as a domain of anthropology. But does this lead us to yet another form of knowing better than the members of society in which we work, knowing the motives unknown to them, a search for the real behind the ordinary, or can a descent into the ordinary, and Vina Das's lovely phrase referencing philosopher Stanley Cavell, reveal the hidden? Is a deep commitment to the ordinary compatible with the understanding of the subject and the program of investigating and theorizing subjectivity sketched out here? And can these be translated into modes of ethnographic in inquiry? These are some of the questions that motivate the question that frames this panel, does psychological anthropology need a post-colonial psycho psychology, which others on the panel will address. Thank you.